You know what's always driven me nuts? The way that college football determines its national champion. I mean, the ranking system always drives me nuts. The system has always been based on reputation more than anything else. It's really difficult to accurately compare teams because they play unbalanced schedules against different uh, levels of competition. And this does remain a problem today. Well, I've often wondered what college football would be like if we had a different system, and so I decided to try one out myself. I set up a promotion and relegation system for college football and decided to run an experiment. I'm using Action PC Football and I'm having the game play automatically through full seasons. The Action PC Football community has created a bunch of classic college football seasons. In fact, every year from 1968 through 1987 has been creative, which is quite impressive. That's the chief reason I'm using Action PC Football, by the way. There's so many seasons to choose from and so many of these are consecutive, so it means that this project is actually pretty easy to set up. And it also helps that the game engine works pretty well too. Here's how I set up my pyramid. We've got 8 teams at the top in the championship. These 8 teams play against each other twice for 14 total games. The winner is the champion. It's that simple. Below that are 16 teams divided into two leagues. We'll call one the American League and the other the National League. The winners of those two leagues will play against each other at the end of the season in a championship game. The winner of that championship game is promoted next season. The worst team in the top rung is relegated down to this level. That gives teams extra incentives to win, in theory at least. Of course, since this is a computer simulation, I can't really project the pressure or the impact that this would put on head coaches, but I'm sure you can imagine. In the third rung, there are four leagues with eight teams each, 32 in all. Alright, I should note that the names of the leagues at that third tier come from the famous Four Horsemen of Notre Dame, Stuhltreyer, Miller, Crowley, and Leiden. Two teams are promoted from the third tier to the second tier. The top four teams are paired off randomly to play a championship game before moving up, and the bottom team in each league in the second rung is relegated. Finally, the bottom four teams in the bottom rung are in threat of complete relegation. At the start of each new season, I'll choose the best four teams not included in this project and we'll have them play at random against the four teams in last place. In other words, to advance, you have to play and win a high stakes game. Nothing comes for free in this setup. I started this off with the 1968 college football season. It turns out that 1968 is a great starting point. Both the AP and the UPI polls agreed on the top 8 teams at the end of 1967, which means that there were no disputes. Our championship league was easy to pin down. Note that I'm not looking at preseason rankings in 1968 or anything like that. Really, this initial season is the only one in which the official polls are going to make much of a difference. The teams after this point have to prove themselves on the field. I took the next best 16 teams to fill up the second rung. Then 32 more winning teams filled up the third rung. You'll notice that I didn't take into account strength of schedule or any of that stuff. I deliberately decided to ignore all of that. The point here is to create a system in which teams prove their ability by winning on the field. We want to create a system that does not take into account reputation. I also made a few adjustments to the rules such as implementing the 2022 NFL overtime system in hopes of reducing tied games. Now for some strange reason Action PC Football doesn't really have options for the college football overtime system. I don't understand why. I've also noticed on posts on the official forum that the game has a real hard time with how college football overtime works. So it doesn't really matter all that much to me. I mean I think the NFL system here is just fine. I then made the controversial decision to turn on the so-called alternative reality mode. So this is important because I have each of these teams playing 14 games each, which of course is more than they played in real life. My understanding is that this alternate reality mode makes players uh, perform according to ratings within the game as opposed to trying to hold them to exactly what they did in real life. I'm not sure I fully understand the difference, but I think it allows for a little bit more leeway for projects like this one. 
I also thought that this would help with the game's fatigue system, which I find very, very frustrating. And of course, it's always interesting to see the results. Another controversial decision I made was to allow for all formations and possible plays. I did that because I wanted to let the computer do whatever it wanted to do in any situation rather than being a slave to real life. I turned on a bunch of usage penalties and ratings. I also made sure that the fatigue meter was on. That sort of thing drives me nuts when I play a replay myself, but if the computer's playing all the games, I don't really mind. Okay, I should make this clear. I did not allow for any interleague play or interdivisional play. Teams only played against the other seven teams in their own league. They played against each team twice, once at home and once away. And what happened in the end of this project really shocked me. So let's start from the lowest leagues and work our way up. Ohio State won the real life national championship in 1968. They were obvious favorites to win the Leyden League. They wound up winning only six and losing eight. Ohio State won its first two games but then started to struggle, losing four in a row. They were shut out three times by Arizona, Old Miss, and on the last day of the season, Tulsa. Though their defense was great, their offense really struggled. I told you that the results were shocking. For a while, it seemed that Utah State would finish on top of the Leyden League. Utah State was led by legendary quarterback John Pappas and a pass-heavy offense. After winning an impressive 10 straight, Utah State stumbled, losing to Clemson, tying Tulsa, and then losing to Ohio State. It was still an impressive statistical performance from a team I never thought would win. Clemson, meanwhile, wound up winning the division. Dayton surprised everybody by winning the Crowley division with a 13-1 record. Dayton was led by Bernie Cress, whose name is spelled wrong here, by the way. Cress racked up an amazing 7.4 yards per carry, rushing to lead everybody. Pretty good for a small independent team that was only 5-5 five five in real life. Michigan won the Stultreyer League. The Wolverines won 13 straight before losing to Arkansas in the final game of the season. And West Virginia went undefeated in the Miller League, advancing to the promotion playoff game. Again, remember that this is not designed to be realistic. It's just a game that's sort of loosely based on real life. It's something that lets us speculate about what might have actually happened. None of the four winners that we've talked about had particularly good seasons in 1968 in real life. Clemson sneaked past West Virginia 20-13 in the first play-in game, leading to their promotion. It wasn't as close as the score would have you believe. West Virginia passed well, but couldn't deal with the Clemson ground game. Meanwhile, Michigan destroyed Dayton, which wasn't much of a surprise. Michigan got out to a quick 28-0 lead and hung on in that game. Dayton just couldn't get anything done offensively. And so Michigan and Clemson will move up to the second tier for next season, 1969. Speaking of which, let's take a look at that second tier and see what happened. The Georgia Bulldogs easily won the American League with a 12-2 record. Georgia's offense was spectacular, gaining over 400 yards per game. The National League was a bit closer. Arizona State wound up winning in the end. The Sun Devils beat Florida State on the last game of the season to clinch it. The final game really wasn't all that close. Arizona State came out to a big lead, and they never relinquished it. And then the upstart Sun Devils surprised me by sneaking past Georgia in a thrilling play-in game. Quarterback Joe Spagnolo led Arizona State to a late drive to take care of Georgia. Well, and so Arizona State will advance to the championship level. Speaking of which, what happened up there? Notre Dame happened, that's what. Notre Dame didn't have the best season in real life in 1968. However, they were simply awesome in this project, winning 11 straight before finally losing. Nobody else could catch them. And so Notre Dame are the champions of the college football world in 1968, at least according to this experiment. Yeah, you know, things probably would have been different if I had used the 1968 final rankings to set everything up instead of the 1967 final rankings. But you know what? Don't worry about it too much. As we start playing through these seasons, this sort of thing will even out. The nice thing about promotion and relegation is that you really can't hide it if you're not a good team. 
And speaking of which, who were the big losers? Tennessee were relegated from the championship league after a really bad season. They only scored 48 points all year. Minnesota and Syracuse were relegated to the third rung. Syracuse lost all 14 games and only scored 16 points all season. They looked like they didn't even belong in this league. They weren't that bad in real life, of course. I'm not quite sure what happened. Well, remember, we're playing in an alternative reality mode, and we're just letting the computer play it out along with the players. All sorts of things could happen. It's just surprising to see them play so poorly. Northwestern will have to play before the 1969 season to stay in the project. Michigan State will as well. They had a worse season than Navy, believe it or not. Southern Mississippi lost all 14 games and will also face an elimination game. And finally, Nebraska, who went 6-4 and four in real life, won only twice and will have to play for their lives. Well, we'll cover those games at the beginning of next season. As I mentioned, Kress wound up leading the league in rushing. O.J. Simpson with USC came in ninth with 1,900 yards. Bill Montgomery with Arkansas had the best passing rating. He racked up over 3,000 yards and 22 touchdowns. And it was Dayton with the best offense in the entire project. West Virginia, meanwhile, had the best defense. But, of course, it's hard to compare those teams directly since they didn't play against each other. This is the sort of project that was really designed for multiple seasons. In other words, this is a marathon, not a sprint. I mentioned that real-life national champions Ohio State had a frustrating 6-8 and eight season. Penn State, who also went undefeated in real life, wound up stumbling out of the gates, finishing at 7-7. Seven and seven. And USC looked awful in the early going, finishing with 3 wins, 10 losses, and a tie. So what do you think will happen in 1969? As you remember, 1969 was the year of undefeated Texas and Arkansas squaring off in one of the greatest games of all time. Both teams are going to be stuck in the third tier in this version. I'd consider both USC and Notre Dame to be favorites to win in 1969 based on their real-life final rankings. Well, but you never know what's going to happen, and that's really the fun of a project like this. I mean, you really never know what's going to happen until you play the games. So what do you think about this? Let me know down below.